Hi everybody and welcome. I'm Terry Ryder, founder of Hot Spotting, and today we're going to discuss a subject that will have increasing importance, I think, to investors as the year unfolds. My guest presenters will be speaking about the benefits of investing in new properties rather than established ones and examining the different approaches investors can take, whether it be passive, proactive or aggressive. Right now, everything seems to be pointing real estate buyers of all sorts towards new properties. First home buyers, for example, don't receive a grant unless they buy or build new. And since changes in 2017, plan and equipment depreciation can only be claimed on new properties, which is an incentive for investors to buy new. And now we're on the cusp of a federal election in which the potential winner is proposing to remove negative gearing benefits unless you buy new properties. But in many ways, these issues are the icing on the cake, not the cake itself. My guests today are strong advocates of the intrinsic benefits of investing in new real estate. But before I introduce them, be aware that if you have questions or comments, type them into the comments panel or the Q&A panel you should see in front of you and we'll respond to your questions towards the end of the webinar. Now, Danny Buxton, Paul Meergaard and Stephen Hall are key people in the Triple Zero Property Group, which is a member of the Hotspotting Panel of Partners, and they specialise in helping Australians invest in new properties. Danny, Paul, Stephen, welcome. Thank you so much, Terry. So, uh, great to be with you guys again. Um, we'd love to work with you guys. So just so you know who we are, Danny's uh, to my right here. So Danny Buxton, I'm Stephen Hall to my left, and I'm Paul Mergard. Um, I think we might be swapping any other way than what's on the on the screen on the graphic, but um, yeah. Well, guys, just before we get into the nuts and bolts of the work, workshop, we just um, wanted to give out a disclaimer, just that you know it's been prepared for us for this hotspotting webinar. Um, basically, what we want to say, you can have a read through that, but we want to just make sure that we always say to our clients, make sure you get professional advice from qualified professionals whether that be your accountant, um, your financial planner, um, you talk to other property people, get people around you that's gonna help you on your investment journey. Um, because again, we're big believers on just making sure that you've got people on your team that are gonna guide you along that journey. Don't just take our word for what we're talking about today as well. So, all right, well, today we're gonna to walk through and just talk through the kind of three different types of uh, in, you know, investment strategies you might have. And then what goes into those kind of properties? So we're going to give you some examples of properties that we've done for clients uh, over time and see how you can generate uh, income through all those different types of properties. So we'll look at the, the passive, which is your buy and your rent out, it's your long-term strategy. Your proactive investors who will buy rent, they might sell something or try and manufacture some growth into a property. And then your aggressive buyers who, who might go through and buy and, and develop. So you're looking for some of that more immediate growth. You might do more of the you know, small to medium scale development. So again, I hope this, this afternoon as we talk through this, it, it gives you an idea of some of the different ways that you can invest in property, particularly when you're doing new property. I just wanted to start off too by just giving you the reasons why we particularly like new property. This is an investment strategy that the three of us and, and all of us at, at Triple Zero Property use personally. Um, we all invest in the same areas that our clients are investing in and, um, you know, and do similar very you know the, the similar types of properties and at different times in, in our journeys we've actually used these different strategies uh, for each of us but you know the, the, one of the reasons for us why it must be new is because of your tax benefits and for me I'm, an, I'm a former accountant I used to work for KPMG and so I love being able to minimize tax any way I can I think that goes with the game but your, your first area of minimizing tax is just on your stamp duty so if you're doing in Queensland this is an example in Queensland if you're buying a second-hand property that's worth $550,000, you're gonna pay $17,775 in stamp duty. If you do a house and land purchase, or you know you can get two contracts, or a land contract and a build contract, still worth five fifty, dollars um, but your stamp duty on that land is only gonna be $7,875. Again, this is in Queensland, so it might be different in other states, or the amounts might be different in other states, but again, trying to get two contracts, it, you make some savings there now. It is fair enough if you're doing two contracts, you'll have progress payments to go along during the build. So I just wanted to add those in just so we're being you know, complete in the numbers, but you've got around about six and a half thousand dollars maybe worth of interest on that particular property that we'll be looking at. Um, but you're still at about three thousand four hundred, um, even with your uh, during construction. So 
You've also then got some depreciation benefits. Now, there were already changes in depreciation on um, property two years ago on the federal budget. You used to, in, you know, again, you used to be able to get your um, 2.5% depreciation on your building, and then you'd get on average 20% over the first five years of holding a property. Now, the government changed the rules two years ago that you no longer get that 20% depreciation on your fixtures and fittings on a second-hand property. But you still get that if you're doing a new property or if you're doing a significant renovation. So if you're doing new property, again, you've just got extra tax benefits that are coming through. Um, so you'll still get your 2.5% depreciation on the building, but you're also going to get the full benefit of depreciation on your, um, your fixtures and fittings. Now, again, everyone's, and Terry, you've already alluded to this with the federal election probably in the next four or five weeks. Um, a lot of questions around negative gearing, and obviously Labor's got a policy there to, to stop negative gearing, but their policy is only to stop negative gearing on second-hand property from the 1st of January 2020 is what they're currently proposing. So what we're even seeing going forward, it's not, it's actually not true that negative gearing will stop totally if we have a change of government. It, just, it will just be that you won't get any negative gearing benefits on second-hand property, but you'll still get it on brand new property. So even going forward, you're still going to get that. Well, a couple of other things we like why we like new property. One, you've got your minimal ongoing maintenance because everything's new, nothing really needs fixing. Um, you've got your building and construction uh, warranty. Uh, you've got tenant appeal. So again, I've, you know, we often find in our properties that people are comparing essentially the same property side by side, but one's older, one's brand new. People will generally pick that, that new property. We want properties that are rentable. So we, you know, again, it's, it's where we we use with a lot of our clients, Terry's material, we're looking for locations. So we want to be close to major infrastructure projects, um, you know, areas that tenants actually want to live in. We want to be in a variety of dwellings. Um, so again, not just uh, you know, having properties in, in something where you've got 100 of exactly the same. Uh, we want some variety of, of the dwellings in the area that you're in, and we want something that's hassle free. And again, for us, we're looking for good capital growth. Um, so you're getting that sustainable growth with your tax benefits. And you're also thinking about your eventual resale market. A lot of people, I think, when they go into property, they think short term sometimes in that. Oh, what do I think sort of work now? I like to, when I'm talking to clients, you know, where do you want to be in 10 years' time and who are you going to sell this property to in 10 years' time? So you just got that end result in mind as well about who you're selling that property, property to uh, down the track. So, so I hope... That makes sense just as a bit of a start, but I'm going to throw over to Steve. He's going to kick off and uh, talk us through the, uh, what it means, what we, talk, what we mean by passive uh, styles of property. Yeah, yeah thank you, Paul. Um, but I'll run you through the first part of it, the passive uh, way of investing in the styles of property that that suits. So the first one that comes to mind is the general house and land package. Okay, so we nice like house, Steve. Yeah, yeah, so I actually picked that photo for this presentation. That's actually my property. <laughs> so again, in one of Terry's, um, an area that Terry supports. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's a nice package, that one. <laughs> but look, house and land, okay? You stand alone dwelling, okay? No body corporate fees. We like it. It's usually a two-part contract, okay? You can buy it, especially if it's a spec home or something like that. You can get them on a single contract. But as Paul mentioned before with your tax benefits and um, avoiding the stamp duty um, implications we like to stick um, our clients with these two contracts um, okay it is a long-term investment okay I like the passive investment I chose this property because I wanted to set and forget okay I want something that's going to work for me in the background um, for a long period of time and I don't have to worry about it and don't have to do a lot of work behind it Okay, and it's, it's probably that whole thing content. about the end result on this property. It's a five-bedroom house, so the end result is you've got mum and dad down the truck when you go to sell it. Hopefully, you've got a family coming to buy it, and hopefully, they might have that emotion pull uh, when they come to buy it. And it's certain the demographics of that particular yeah. area, which is very much family focused. So you've got to take all that into account. So. Yeah, definitely. And obviously, the last note there, the lean content. You know, we always like the percentage of the lean um, value to be up there around that 70-30 if we can you know, on that um, particular style. So I'll give you an example on that right here. So this is, we talk about the numbers, okay? When we talk with all our clients, it's always about the numbers when you're talking about investment. Okay, so here's a prime example is one of the clients that we did uh, a property for in the same estate actually, back in May 2017. So look, the numbers 245, 300 for the land, 
260450 for the house. Gave a total package price of 505750 Now, that, that particular property rented that week, the week after it handed over, and they were getting $550 a week rent for that property. So again, great yield, okay? Set and forget, they don't have to worry about too much. Tenants in there, it's a long-term strategy. And this particular client, um, a year later to the day, so 12 months, May 2018, got a valuation on the property. Okay, 585,000 came in that. So you're looking at, you know, for a very simple strategy, a very good uplift. Now, we don't always say that you're going to get that uplift. Okay, it may be very a lot slower in different areas, but for this particular client, it worked very well. And I believe Danny pulled that equity out of that they, property to yeah, get another one. That client was able to use their equity to go and then repeat the same process. And again, one of those growth focused areas that that you'll find in the hotspot and reports that uh, you do, Terry. But again, great results there for the client uh, where he was it suited his needs because uh, it was a way a lot and he just wanted that something that was just passive in the background. And again, just, just great numbers for him and, and it worked. Yeah, yeah, cool. It's all about the numbers. That's it. All right, so I'll run through another style of property. Uh, we'll talk about the townhouse briefly. Now, this can come from an affordability uh, perspective. I think you'll find the townhouse is probably, you know, your higher density living in around the CBD areas uh, suited to a particular demographic. Um, you know, younger professional, young families possibly, things like that. Okay, the difference between, you know, a townhouse and, and your land, uh, house and land, is you are a single contract, okay? But with that comes benefits too. You're eligible for self-managed super fund. Um, as well, if you're going to lend through your self-managed super fund. Okay, it's an attached dwelling. So you will have body corporate fees incorporated in, into, the, um, into this investment strategy. All right, and there is a certain risk, I suppose, that comes with townhouses because you want to be, you know, taking the advice from experts like Terry Ryder where you're buying in the right area because you will settle on that, you will go unconditional on that contract and pay a 10% deposit and then settle once the, the project is complete. And that can sometimes take up to a year, even, even longer in some cases. So you wanna make sure that your, your property value is growing in value, not declining. A lot of people have got themselves into trouble in certain markets around that where their property has actually decreased in value. And ensuring that you're building with a reputable builder as well, because uh, the last thing you want is your deposit to be paid and then there to be delays, unnecessary delays, or even the ability of financial uh, issues along the way. So, uh, the risk, particularly there for us, is around the financing side of it because your finance normally lasts for about three months. So mm -hmm. normally you're signing a, a contract uh, and going unconditional, uh, knowing that you're going to have to reapply for that finance in, in nine months, 12 months' time down the track. Yeah. I think the other, the other thing we often talk with clients about too, if you do are going into a townhouse development, to go into a smaller boutique yeah. development. Not one where you've got you know 50 to 100 townhouses and swimming pools and gyms because you're going to be paying big body corporate fees. So our sweet spot is around that five to, to nine, 10, 12 properties. Yeah. Not much bigger than that. And that's where we see the, the bigger uplift. And it tends to suit more the owner occupiers as well because you want that nice owner occupiers uh, as much as you can in, in that development. And that, I suppose, will bring us to our example. Um, this was a bank of, I believe, nine. Yep. Nine, nine townhouses in this lot. Um, this particular client was purchased probably through their self-managed super fund, um, and it's only recently just handed over. Actually, no, it actually doesn't hand over. I think it hands over next week. Next week. Yeah. Uh, for this particular client, but as, as Steve said, it's purchased in their self-managed super fund. Uh, purchased around about 485, as you can see there. Yeah. I signed contracts at the beginning, or probably mid last year, and so it's been around about nine months project this time. Yeah. And so. It's um, great, rent, rent, yeah. great rental yield. We've actually negotiated with the builder to make sure we've actually got a tenant for the property already. And look, that's a great rental yield, 5.63% for something in their self-managed super fund. It's going to give them great returns. Um, they got a valuation at the end of the project, 520. So, you know, 35K uplift, still a good uplift. We're not going backwards, we're going forwards, okay? We're always looking for those areas that are going to grow in value for our clients. And this really suited them for their super fund because it's certainly a buy and hold strategy uh, where they just, again, set, forget, not worry about it. You tick the box for them for their affordability, but also the affordability of the area for rentals. So it was rented very quickly, already tenants in place prior to handover. Yeah, so it was a great little project um, for that client. 
So another one, and this is one that, so terrace style properties, okay, terrace houses. Here's where some people get the terrace style and the townhouse confused. Okay, the main difference between a terrace and a townhouse is you are on your own title, okay? So there is actually a split. You know, people think that they're all adjoined, but there is actually a five centimetre gap between the terraces, okay? And that block of land is yours, okay? You're not part of a body corporate um, set up in, with a terrace style house, okay? It is on your own title. Again, two part contract, usually like you're only paying um, your stamp duty on the land portion, okay? And you'll go through the same process as you would a house and land. So you'll have your, your progress payments with the builder, et cetera. But look, you know, it's probably a newer thing up the southeast Queensland rather than down. You'll see this more down in Sydney, Melbourne. The terrace style housing is probably a lot more popular down there in that higher density living. But it is definitely starting to move up the coast and, and around. You certainly see a lot more of it because of affordability, because the land is getting more and more expensive. So it just provides, and also too, I guess people are looking for high density living, they're not looking for such a big block of dirt. Yeah. Uh, depending on, again, one of the big things you notice on this, this particular photo you'll see there, this, what we like about these terraces is its location. Uh, it's in Newport in, on the Redcliffe Peninsula, which is, uh, again, one of those hot spotting uh, peaks that uh, Terry has, has identified, but it's also opposite a park. Yeah. So without having very really much of a yard, uh, it's right opposite a park, so it gives a lot of space. These ones particularly were, um, the, you'll notice the inclusion, just from the photo there, probably saw a high inclusion list because the target demographic and audience was more that, oh, you know, more professionals, working professionals with one or two children. And, and again, to a hospital too, walk, so to, got walk, got walk to train doctors. station, new railway line, a oh. hospital, but it just meets or suits the lifestyle that people are looking for. So. Yeah. So the numbers? So the numbers, yeah, look, you get a total package price of uh, 509500 uh, 509, Okay, the rent to is 575 so to, still around that 5%. Couple that with your tax depreciation and the other features, you're going to come back to, again, another uh, probably neutral to positive cash flow. Um, but again, another buy and hold strategy. It's another form of passive investment. You set, you forget. You put someone in there, rents out, and look, this particular, especially with this area, um, the next two to three years, we really expect the yeah. growth to come in there. Like, I think absolutely, I so, because I've got yeah. in that estate. So, <laughs> yeah, so there you go. We, we put our money where our mouth is, we're investing in the areas we put yes, our yes. money in. As they said, like with the infrastructure that's going in there, with the development that's happening, we've stopped them being the developer in this instance. Uh, we're seeing a significant amount of money being spent in the area. It is a, it's probably the only area in that. On the peninsula, yeah, where there is where there is land, and uh, obviously being Bayside, medium house price is just under a million dollars. So we yeah. we see good uplifts and walk to facilities, so. good benchmarks there. So yeah, uh, so the tick the box six twenty. Yeah, so still. But we wouldn't forward. do terrace housing everywhere. It just it's very dependent on the location to maximise the growth. And it can also depend on the client's affordability and their needs, and everything comes down to. What's right for that client? Yeah, and that's that's why we're talking through these different styles of investment, passive style investment, you know, which suits. I'm 34, you know, I've got a lot of time on the sleeve that. <laughs> so I want something set and forget and, and to get that time in the market to work for me. So, but that puts us on to the next style, I suppose, and I'll let Paul take over that um, and talk about the next style. We're moving into a proactive style of investment now. Yeah, these are the people, I guess, that want a little bit more, um, probably more rental yield on some of these, but you're also a little bit more budget as well because the next two styles of uh, properties, we're going to talk about the dual key and then the duplex, uh, your build costs are a little bit more because you've got more stuff going into them. So your, uh, your dual keys, again, get a lot of, um, uh, we've had a lot of clients asking about them. One of the things we are finding in a lot of council areas that councils aren't necessarily liking them um, or... You do have, you know, some estates that don't want dual occupancies uh, in their estate. So again, it's, it's trying to find the right locations for them, but they do work really well in the right areas. So your, uh, your dual key is where you've, you've got kind of your main house and you've almost got the granny flat next door to you, but they are adjoined. So they're adjoined, um, they're on one title, so you can't sell off the granny flat down the track. Um, they just have that one title. But again, what we find on these, you can get your two contracts, so your land contract and then your build contract. You don't have body corporate fees on them because you own both of them, but you've got two lots of rent coming in on both of those. And I think one of the keys on these, and 
you know, we've, we've seen you know, various designs of them. You often find, you know, maybe the living area in the granny flat's not great, but if you've got a good builder you're working with and you've got a right, the right plan, like we've had some recently done for some clients and their living area is just fantastic. It's, um, you know, they're not small and pokey and I guess that's the thing you've got to watch out for these. So just to give a bit of an idea of um, one of the dual keys that, that um, we've got on the go at the moment, the land cost is two forty nine. Um, the house cost is 320 so again, slightly bigger for your build cost because you've got two kitchens, you've got three bathrooms, five bedrooms. Um, so again, it, it is just a bit bigger, but it's all rent for $720 a week. So you're looking at 6.5%, 6.57% rental yield. So again, for someone that's really looking for cash flow, and um, but again, when we look for these, we're not just looking for cash flow. We also want to be in a growth area. So it's yeah. not about finding an area where you're going to get no cover of growth in the next 10 years. We still want to tick that box of being in areas where you think you can get, uh, get capital, good capital growth, but you have got the extra cash flow uh, coming through. And actually, we've had a lot of clients even asking for these lately where you might have a, you know, a, a mum or a, a dad or a family, but they've got older kids and they want them to live next door or they've got the mother-in-law coming to live with them. And you know, it's, with the mother-in-law next door. So um, there are you know, multiple reasons why people might want a dual occupancy property. Did you want your mother-in-law there, Danny? We then go on to our duplexes. So duplexes, you know, again, you've got two uh, separate properties that can be on two titles. Some people will do them as one title and keep both of them. But I suppose they're more down that uh, townhouse model that you'd be building both of them. So. You might have a three bedroom or four bedroom even duplexes on each side. Um, you got your firewall down in the middle and you can go through and do your strata title in the lows too. So if you want to sell one of them or you can keep them or you can sell both or, or, or keep one, sell one kind of thing. So it just gives you flexible, uh, flex, flexible options about what you can do over the dual occupancy. So. Because we often talk about exit strategy and understanding yeah. your exit strategy. So what we do like about duplexes, is it, it does, as, as Paul said, it gives uh, clients the ability to have choice, mm -hmm. as, as you said, to rent them both out, still get a good yield, yeah. sell one, pay down the other, or pay off mortgage on their own home, depending on what their strategy is, get a better yield, yeah. Uh, yeah. or to sell them both with, with manufacturing yeah. growth. Yeah. And that's what we're seeing on this one here. So uh, this is a, uh, dual, a duplex that we've got a client looking at at the moment. The land is worth 315. The bill for both of them is 453. So it's a total, a total build, including your strata fees, of $767,000. They should rent for 920 a week all up for, for the two of them. Um, but we've actually got sales appraisals on these because uh, you know, clients are looking at selling one of them um, once it's been finished. And that sales appraisal has come back at 450000 per site. That's from an independent agent. Yeah. So, mm. Not yet. That hasn't been done anyone to do with us. We've actually, well, I think there's been two agents that have done, mm. had a look at that. So, so again, if you, you know, on, on the completion of that, um, <clears throat> we're looking at 132000 uplift. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, again, for that client where they want to sell one of them afterwards and just liquidate some of that cash, again, um, it's a really good option, I think, for some of those to get your good, your good rents coming through, but also then that capital growth. Yeah. So you're moving out of your passive into a more proactive style, and you're actually doing a little bit more yeah. to generate more income. Yeah. And then we'll lead them to, I suppose, the uh, the more aggressive style, which will work. Then. So I love splitters. Uh, we used to do a lot of splitters for clients uh, a few years ago, particularly when we were in in Brisbane in a market which wasn't growing, and we were seeing really good growth for a client. Uh, all the box tend to be uh, infill developments. So, uh, for example, this one here, uh, single property, normally would have a house on it. You need to do a feasibility, look at your risk versus reward. Uh, unfortunately, we do see a lot of people uh, when we're going to look at a property for a client. Um, sometimes, you know, we, we know what we want to spend to make the money, and we see some of these going for significantly more than what we believe the value is there. And, uh, we don't believe you do these for practice. Uh, there's too much money at stake. So you need to understand your risk versus reward. Uh, you've got to take into account and really understand your demo and site costs, uh, your DAs and services, where's your water sitting, where's your sewage, um, power. Uh, we've had somewhere we, you know, we've looked at and then as we talked to the town planner, uh, we've realised that there's additional upgrades required with three-phase power to the street, with um, 
a whole pile of different myriad of things. And so you really need to have a, a good working relationship with your town planner. Uh, so you need to understand all those additional upfront costs that are incurred. The benefits though is, is in doing this, and if you know what you're doing, you can manufacture some really good growth uh, with obviously having two separate titles and, and two houses on each. So we have those numbers of a property. Uh, those photos actually probably been done in, uh, in Nudgee, an area that uh, we really liked and we still do like, uh, just, just uh, affordability is a bit, a bit hard. So here are the numbers of the property we looked at for one of our clients recently. Um, where we're getting a purchase price of six hundred and fifty thousand dollars with your legals and stamps, uh, around about six seventy eight, six seventy seven thousand. Our development costs, including all our site costs with sewer work, earthworks, retaining, uh, in this one we had to remove a tree, infill a pool. Uh, we were about hundred thousand dollars. Our build cost uh, in the house, the two story house that we're doing. Uh, this was a ten by, was a twenty by forty, so two ten by forties. Uh, was uh, $340,000 per house with a total cost per site, including land costs of seven, just under 730000 Our market appraisal, $860,000 uh, by, uh, again, different agents down there that we work closely with. Uh, so we've seen an uplift around about $130,000 per side. Um, now, generally, for a lot of clients, uh, they'll, again, some will want to keep, uh, we either keep because the rental appraisal in this around about at six. 650 uh, is what they're achieving. So the yield probably a little bit less, but we still see room for growth. So the decision for the client is ensuring uh, how much growth, where do we see that growth? Do I hold on to it for a little while or sell? Or do I sell immediately? Uh, the process around about a 12 month process from signing land contract. So again, we're from a capital gains tax. If you are selling, uh, you get that capital gains discount uh, after your 12 months by the time we're finished. Um, so that's uh, yeah, no, the, just an example of a splitter block. Again, I think a lot of fun, but you've just got to make sure you know what you're doing. A lot of expense though too, you know, you total project costs around that 1.4 mil. So you just need to know that you've got the affordability to do that. So um, Feasibility is so, so important. Absolutely. And, no and I think cash flow. a lot of your money you'll make on that too, is particularly your, your original purchase price. So that initial purchase price when you're buying that old... You've got to buy the right spot. Yeah. Honestly, make sure which is the, the lay of the land talking with your builder, uh, making sure you've got all those parties working together. Uh, so we're very big on making sure our clients uh, are cash ready. So if you're gonna do this sort of strategy, make sure we know where you sit financially so we can go in, we can we can go hard with our conditions uh, to get that, that, that purchase price right at the very beginning, knowing what our costs are. And, and through our way that we do this with our clients, we've been able to get fixed pricing in that process. So there's no, no nasty surprises along the way, which can happen. And often we see that we're actually building a property for a client at the moment, an owner occupier who has picked up a block where uh, a doctor thought he knew what he was doing in, in a development and uh, has, has come unstuck with the additional costs incurred. So we've been able to pick up that lane in, 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 a, in a dream spot for them. So I suppose another big part of it is your accountant too. Buying oh, the right entity with, yeah. with certain things like this. I've heard uh, a lot of horror stories about people buying yeah. the wrong entity. and being up for, you know, if there's $100,000 worth of crap that they've missed out on and different things. Well, that's the same in any, any purchase you're doing, it's making sure you're talking to the right team around you, get the right legal advice, get the right accounting advice. Absolutely yeah. imperative in this, this particular process. Um, the other one is another aggressive is doing your small developments, which you can do clients. Uh, higher risk, but uh, and greater capital required. So again, the, the more money we're trying to make there, there is additional risk attached, but there's obviously potentially much higher returns available. Your feasibility is absolutely essential in this process, and you really got to work out, is the risk worth the reward? So a lot of things that you need to consider, which will just uh, come up on screen now, both from understanding your, your engineering certification through town planning, headworks, site surveys, your application fees, getting your architects, land design, all those civils, certifications that you need uh, are very important very important and when you can again this really is all about the numbers your location has to be absolutely right if you have a look at the example of what we've got here and there's an opportunity that we we looked at for again one of our clients in clayfield about six k's five k's from the cbd of brisbane uh it was an older house had a heritage overlay on it uh, we can't remove or demolish the house, but we can move the house. So in this particular instance, um, we're able to, with the purchase price of 1.15, uh, 
uh, with a DA, full DA development cost of about 200,000. Uh, we move the house across to the left. Um, we then renovate the existing house. So we did this in two parts, two stage process. Uh, we renovated the Queensland and then on-sold the Queenslander, which then helped fund the, the next part of the project, which was building three uh, slightly higher level spec townhouses uh, at the rear of the property um, with a sale appraisal of the whole project of about 3.25 once complete. And so we've seen up with there about $450,000 uh, in the process. But you're looking around about a uh, 18 month to two year project, depending on all the bits and pieces of the applications. Um, there are a couple of little hairs on this one, but uh, uh, Town Plan is very confident and comfortable with the process moving forward on that development. Each development is different, each of them has to be looked at in, in its entirety, uh, and you've really got to have a very strict strategy in play. I also believe, too, though, is you've also got to have a backup plan, too, if in the event that one of those properties doesn't sell. Can I hold on to that? Is it affordable to hold on to that? And what's the rent that I'm going to get? So all those factors need to come into play. And your account is a big part of that process. And also having a good uh, legal firm to work with you on that process. And so these are the strategies. All three of these different strategies are things that we do for our clients. I know we've we've looked at uh, house and land. And well, you know, we're able to do house and land projects in, in some of those growth spots that Terry talks about. Uh, you know, in that sub 400 price range um, and uh, where we see opportunity for growth uh, and getting good rental yields so they set, forget and look after themselves. Um, those who are chasing and 10 houses tick a box for certain areas and certain places. We, we've just uh, uh, did a 10 house for a client of ours and also in their super fund, uh, one street back from the water, uh, just down at Calandra Golden Beachway. And we see really good, not just rental yield, but also really good opportunity for growth long term with where it's sitting. But everyone's needs are different and everyone's circumstances are different. And then we're able to sit down with each client and then I guess, uh, I guess identify and tailor the solution that's right for them to achieve the goals that they're trying to achieve through property. But location is something we haven't really talked a lot about, but that's an important part of the process. Um, because you can do all these strategies, but if your location's wrong, it's going to go pear-shaped. And so, you know, having the resources around you, um, you know, obviously tapping into the research reports from Terry, uh, talking to locals on the ground, uh, and then I guess building your team and having a team of experienced experts around you who can specialise in this and is able to, and able to guide you through that process step by step. So everyone's strategy is different, so it's understanding What's the right strategy for you? You know, what, what helps you, what allows you to sleep at night? We always call it the sleep test. And, you know, Terry, we've talked about often about, you know, there are lots of different ways to invest in property. Uh, and all those are, are good, but you know, again, we want to try and, and do what's right for the client and that makes them, you don't want to be stressing about your investment. Yeah, and if you're stressing about it, it's probably not the right yeah. answer. So you have a bit of stress. Yeah. But uh, having the right people around you uh, and the guidance to support you through that process. Yes, yeah, so Danny, I suppose the um, that that speaks to your process and helping people do this. Um, perhaps you could you talk through some of your process and how you people and help people invest in some of these types of property. And I imagine a key part of that is understanding the client, their situation, what they already own, how much they earn, all of that. Yeah. And which of these strategies is right for them? Yeah, well, one of the things we haven't also talked about is, is your finance and your finance structure as well is also an imperative part of that process. So for us, the first thing we do is we sit down with a client and we want to understand what is it that you're wanting to achieve? What is, what is the purpose for you wanting to invest in property? And then from there, a bit of a fact find and understanding, I guess, affordability and comfort level. They're two very different things. Uh, how much can you afford to borrow? And also, what's your comfort level uh, from a strategy? Often we have a lot of people who want the, the, the strategy of aggressive growth. But when we sit down, we look at the numbers, and as you would have seen there, both in the passive and the proactive and the aggressive, there's still uplift, and you're actually still manufacturing growth for that process. Mm -hmm. So it's really identifying the right spots. 
often though we come into and when we look at property we take our own prejudices into the decision making we've got to try to remove those prejudices when it's investment it is about the numbers it's about where we see the growth you don't have to live where you're investing in your property and i know that the properties you have terry and, and that we all have are not where we live but they're areas where we see opportunity for growth we see opportunity for good long-term growth or quick growth you know we've done some developments personally where we've been able to flip very quickly and, and make good profit out of um, i still wish i had some of those because they're continuing to grow um, but they suited uh, a strategy that we were working with at that time getting the right finance around here we want to then go out and understand how much you can borrow make sure it's with it particularly in the current lending market that we're in at the moment we are for a lot of people at the moment it's probably sitting on their hands waiting uh, and there doesn't seem to be urgency but there are some really good as you know Terry, some great opportunities out there in the marketplace at the moment and we've i mean we've got that one we've got one block of land we've actually got access to and i don't know what the developer's strategy is with it but he's given a 10 percent discount on the land at the moment it's only one particular block there's nothing wrong with the block but he's obviously a bit of a cash so I think for him, he hasn't given, he's not given that option on the other blocks of land, but it's just something we've been able to pick up for, for some clients where, you know, on a $380,000 block of land, there's a $38,000 rebate on that at, at settlement. settlement. Yeah. So it's those people that can move on that. They're gonna, yeah. they're gonna get there's some good advantage. options at the moment where, again, you know, for people that are, are prepared to, you know, I suppose, bite the bullet, they'll um, can, can make, make advantage of, of, you know, not being in a market that's, um, uh, full of lots of buyers at the moment. But that doesn't suit everybody. It's a matter of us sitting down and understanding the strategy for the client. Uh, with respect to your question there, Terry, is, is every client is different. So it's understanding what is the purpose, why are you wanting to do this, and then working with that client to, if they don't have the right team around them, to help fill that team. We believe that team needs to be independent. So whether it be an independent financier, an independent lawyer, uh, Accountant, if they haven't got a good property focus account, we can get one. Uh, we can put you in touch with, with, with one uh, who can then help get that strategy in place so when you're buying the right property, you've got the right team working with you. Our focus is just on the property and the property management side of things, which is very important. Um, and uh, you know, we, we've seen, even from a rental perspective, across the board, all of our properties, vacancy of less than 1%. Uh, it's very rare that we don't get at least 5% plus in yield. Uh, but more importantly, we're always looking for where we see that growth. We haven't got a crystal ball, no one does. But by looking at the, the fundamentals, by looking at the infrastructure going on, and look at the areas, we, we go into those. We're probably a little bit risk adverse. We, we, we want to make sure that our clients get it right. And because of that cautiousness, uh, we, are, we get it right each time for those clients. And working with those clients about when they sell, when they hold, and what's comfortable for them to, to continue on and, and build a portfolio if that's what they're after. Uh, you referred a number of times to the importance of uh, picking the right location for uh, whatever you happen to be doing, which of these strategies you choose. And one of our watchers has asked um, about the location of that most recent example. I think it's the one with the, the house and the three townhouses. Yeah. Where was that one located and um, why was it a great location for the style of uh, development? Well, that one was in, in Clayfield in, in Brisbane, so that five, six case in the city, high in property, uh, fairly affluent uh, suburb, has a, a mixed use of dwellings, both a lot of older properties, um, but also a lot of units and townhouses. You've got train infrastructure, you've got the roads, you've got the shopping centre, quick easy access to the airport and the city. Uh, so it, again, uh, not a cheap, as you, as you would have seen, that the, the total package or the total buy-in for that, that client was over $2 million, but was in an area that uh, we see we see Brisbane's very undervalued. We still see a lot of opportunity in Brisbane. Uh, in fact, I think it's from a capital city perspective, it's a great place to be buying in uh, with, with all the infrastructure projects that are on, on the go. Uh, but uh, it, it was just an area that just, just ticked the box. Uh, and it was also an opportunity that became available. So you be ready, and then when the when the right projects come, you need to be ready to be able to pounce quickly, uh, because they do get snapped up. Because we're one of you know thousands of people who are trying to do this as well. So you just got to move quick on those projects. Okay. I uh, just remind people who are watching and listening that if you've got questions for 
Danny or Paul or Stephen or myself, uh, please key them into the, uh, the chat panel or the Q&A panel and we'll do our best to answer them. Just referring back to location, um, I imagine that the different styles of properties you've talked about today, different types of location would be suitable. A dual key type approach, for example, what are the characteristics of a good location for that type of property? Does it relate to the, 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 demographic, the demographic of the people living in those sorts of areas and that might buy or rent those sorts of properties? Yeah, I think, you know, some of those ones that we've got, we've had clients looking at lately, they're in areas which are tend to be older areas. Um, a lot of the new developers, actually, no, well, it depends, actually. Some of the developers won't want your keys uh, in their estates, which I totally understand that, because, you know, with narrow streets and stuff, parking can be an issue. But we've had you know, a few lately uh, close to a hospital in an older area where we've had, uh, there's been, you know, someone's knocked down an older house on a bigger block of land and subdivided it, split it up. And so the blocks of land have been big enough to put a dual key on, so you still get some yard and, and all that sort of thing. But we find in those areas too, you can sometimes either have either students living in that area or you've got an older population potentially. So you might have a family living one side and they might have a, you know, like a single retired person or a student um, living on the other side. Having said that, um, you know, the one that I was saying with the uh, $38,000 rebate on it at the moment is actually dual occupancy five minutes from the beach. Um, yeah. So it, it depends on the area. It really just depends on the area. And that's, that's again, what we do when we, go out to, when we go out to look for those opportunities. You're just looking at, well, who's renting properties in this area? What else is in that area? What's going to fit here? Um, what's the best use for that block of land? And, and who are you competing against yeah. from a rental perspective? So, again, we want to ensure that there's, there's, there's no downtime in rent uh, wherever possible. Um, but the, I guess find the right areas with the land and the ability to do that on the land and also where if there's any covenants that may restrict or, or allow you to do that. And I think it's, it's understanding the right places where you can do that. Uh, you obviously can't do your dual occupancy or your duplexes on a 350 square metre block of land. So, um, well, unless you went up, I guess. But then, yeah. well, mind you, we are, looking at, we are looking at this. Uh, there's a terrace design that we are looking at with one of our builders where we can do a, a potential dual key process there but it, it's quite unique and a little bit different and mm. for us we're not quite sure there we're just waiting for and they're just waiting for the the approval process through through the covenant of the, the developer um again because the developer tradition doesn't like dual keys mm. but if you can get the facade right and you get the feel right and again a lot of that comes down to parking which which mm. um again the, the, and again council very big on ensuring there's enough parking for utilising that and also proximity to certain infrastructure as well. I think that big part, and both of the ones we talked about was proximity to the beach. You know what I mean? A lot of people want the lifestyle and, you know, if you're attracting that one side, which is a, a single person that may want to go to the beach, want to be in a better location, there's a lot more split families these days. So you may have one side of it sort of, uh, you know, on a split family, you've got one single person and then he's going to look for the close to areas where there's also families because his kids might have moved to that school sort of thing. So, yeah. So lifestyle is so so a very important part of that process as well. So okay. employment, lifestyle uh, are key, key things that you yeah. control in, in, in any development, really, in any, any investment, uh, infrastructure and, and, and demographics and, and the growth of that area. I had a question earlier from somebody who wasn't clear about the fundamental difference between a dual key and a duplex. They seem kind of similar to people who don't uh, aren't familiar with those two different types of product. Yeah, I mean, dual key is a um, a dual key is where it's it's one title. It may appear to look like a duplex, uh, but it can't be strata. It can't be separated. Uh, so it'll always be one title, um, whereas a duplex is sets on two separate titles. It tends to be body corporate. Uh, you can actually build a duplex and still not strata title it and it'll be under one title. But a duplex gives you the ability to strata it and then able to separate title. So you can then sell one side and keep the other. Whereas a dual key is, is think of your granny flat. It's the granny flat on the attached to a house. Uh, and will remain with the title, so it's always on that separate title. You can have, you can rent them independently. Uh, you just got to be careful with councils. Some councils 
uh, have very strict rules around dual key where it's going to be uh, a, um, re a relative or related entity needs to be living in that property. Um, so you just need to make sure that you're checking with council that a dual key is, is applicable in that area. So you generally got some council restrictions on the size of that granny flat as Absolutely. well. So the granny flat is pretty much always only one or two bedrooms. You generally can't go bigger than that because it's it, it about 90 square meters or six, depending on where it is. You might only be able to go 90 square meters of, of, of some space. Of that I think in some of those we've been doing lately um, in that particular council area, you can only um, 60. have 60 or 65 square meters. So yeah. So what are the pros and cons of one versus the other? Why, why would you choose a dual key as opposed to a duplex if you're going to do a project? Cost, cost would be one thing, yeah. Affordability to get into yeah. the project. Um, yeah. Duplex is more expensive. It tends to be the land tends to be more expensive because for the ability to separate. So you're paying more on your land and your build costs are probably a little bit more expensive. The benefit of a, of a duplex is you're able to sell one side. So you've got more options available to you so you can keep them both, get good rental yield, you could sell one, pay down the other, get a better rental yield, or you could, and you get that manufactured growth. Whereas in a dual key is, is predominantly, you, you chase that rental yield up front, uh, more so, probably a little bit more affordable to get into, so you get a slightly better rental yield there. But you're still one title, so you can't sell either, either keep it or you sell it, you can't keep part of it. Yeah, so, it's really like a buy and hold, really with a better rental yield for a dual key, and then you're looking at duplex, that segue into your more aggressive where you can sell down one and Agreed. pay off the other. You, know. yeah. um, you referred during the presentation, one of you did, I think, to uh, capital gains tax discount on a splitter block. Um, did I hear that correctly? What's what's the, uh, the detail there? We're referring to the capital gains tax uh, whenever you sell a property yeah, for investment, there's capital gains tax implications. Uh, if the process from signing your contracts to selling is over your 12 months, which normally split a block will take around about that 12 month process. Uh, if you are selling, you know, you're, you're not waiting to the end of the, not holding a vacant property to sell it to, to get your 50% capital gains tax, which is currently in place at the moment with, with our uh, current government, if we do see a change in government, um, the uh, Labor government have proposed removing or reducing that discount to 25% as opposed to 50% after 12 months. Um, there, there was um, one of your earlier uh, case studies um, was, was um, a place where there was a, an 80%, 80, sorry, $80,000 uplift. Um, someone that did done the project and then had a valuation, I think, a year later and got a $80,000 increase. What, what was the location of that particular project? That's actually uh, in Aura. So it was on the in the uh, Sunshine Coast. Yeah. yeah Coast. I think, Terry, one of the things that helped on that property too, it, it's not just the location. So we're, we're certainly seeing some good uplift in that particular development, but it was a five bedroom house as well. Still so we, mm. we, it was a bigger block of land. Um, and we were able to get a five better on that house as well. So again, it's it's where we we often talk about your location is important, but also the style of property you're putting on it, the specification that property is important. What else is being built around there? And that just probably had a few other boxes I think that it ticked as well. Where you know and the timing in that development was important too, and for where it was, um, and, and that wasn't a evaluation from one of us. It was actually from the bank for lending purposes. So. Uh, Jason, in that instance, built the house, used the, got a valuation from the bank, used the equity from that to deliberately actually go out and then duplicate that process. So even though he was a very a passive investment, um, he was able to duplicate very quickly. We would normally, and that was just great, just good timing as well. Timing and time in the market both work together in those processes. Um, but as Paul said, it was the style of housing, the inclusion list, uh, and its location are all brought in together, which then sees that that, that high but, but that was uh, Aura, which is a master plan and uh, communities ongoing work in progress in the southern part of the Sunshine Coast. That's to primary school, state school, you know, walk to zone. There's you know new shopping complex, you know, 200 kilometres of bike pass. I mean, it's a project that will continue on for the next 15, 20 years. It's a massive, massive 
development, but it was just, just well positioned. And um, you know, we've seen clients time and time again where we've been able to find the right property. Uh, you know, we could have done a cheaper option for him in there, but he wouldn't have had the uplift, he wouldn't have had the upgrowth, uh, the growth that, that we've seen without going down that style of housing and a good quality build as well. Um, right at the very beginning, um, you made the point that um, when you do a project this way, as opposed to buying uh, an established property, you only pay stamp duty on the land, not on the build. Is that is that something that applies Australian wide? That's um, universal in Australia. I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's a, uh, an important point for people to keep in mind, but they also have to take into account that there's a a bit of a, a a lag time, so there's there's also an interest cost, which. Um, and, but that interest during construction is actually tax deductible. So you, you, your stamp duty is a capitalised cost. So you claim that back when you sell the property against any any capital gains. But um, whereas your interest during construction, and even the interest you borrow from the interest during construction with your accountants uh, switched on, will be able to apply that, and you'll be able to claim that back up front. So where we're talking about six and a half thousand dollars of in that example of holding costs, that's before the tax benefits come into that. So it actually reduces that uh, again uh, even more. So um, look, it's a lot easier for us to find stuff already built. Uh, I promise you that. But uh, uh, what's best for our clients uh, from an affordability and to minimise? Look, it might only be a couple of thousand, three or four thousand dollars, but it's still three or four thousand dollars is a lot of money. And, and I'd rather in the clients, uh, the pocket of my clients than in that of, of somebody else. If you buy something already built too, more often than not, you're going to have the builder's going to carry his stamp duty, to the buy the land, settle on the land, and his legal costs, that's going to be added again to the price. So you're buying something where there's additional fees and charges and things added into, and his holding costs uh, during that process, I'd rather our client get the benefit of that and be the developer of that land as opposed to being the builder and buying something which is a specky. Okay. So I imagine you guys are constantly on the lookout for opportunities for, for your clients. Uh, what sort of locations are you looking in at the moment where, where you're finding the best opportunities? It all comes down to the client. All right, the borrowing capacity for the client. Borrowing capacity for the client will dictate some of the areas that we look at. Um, so we're certainly doing stuff at the moment on the Sunshine Coast, which again we're we're loving for the infrastructure, you know, spend on the, the sunny coast in the, you know some of the right areas. Um, parts of Brisbane, we're probably more bullish on the north side of Brisbane um, rather than the south or west. Um, but I just think a great opportunity in those areas too. Great opportunity, yeah. yeah. But I just think on the north side where you've got the new university, um, you've got the airport expansion, um, there's some good jobs growth, and you've got your population. Movements as well in the Morton Bay, particularly too. There's some good options there. The digging and deviations board. finally finished. Yeah, the Gateway Motorway is done. That's so. flowing. But then we're doing some stuff down in Ballarat, which again we're big fans of Ballarat. And Danny was down there last week. Was there last week? Just last week. Um, Bendigo is another area that we're 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 looking at very carefully. Adelaide, yeah. uh, even uh, uh, just talking to one of our build partners in Launceston. Um, which is something that we, we just started to look at and uh, it's probably a conversation we'll have offline, Terry, about just understanding some more about the uh, research on those areas there. Uh, again, though, we've got to factor in population, growth, we've got to factor in jobs, economy, mm -hmm. uh, we've got to factor in what's going on in that area where we're seeing that demand to continue to grow. Um, I think we're also big on to just as well, who are we building them with? Um, so we act as like a builder broker. So we want to make sure that our builders stack up and our builders are going to be there for the long term. Yeah. So, um, you know, reading plenty of articles in the news at the moment about builders that are going uh, into liquidation or whatnot because the finances aren't stacking up because it's, you know, it is a tough market for builders at the moment. So again, you just yeah. draw that the builders have got the finances behind them as well. Uh, it's it's very interesting enough. We actually see builders get into more strife when, it's, when they're busier then because they then when it's really quiet because most quite everyone just tightens their belt a little bit but when it gets really busy it's not managing that cash flow effectively not managing their projects yeah. too much growing too quickly all those things we put away up but um but locations again also also too is, is you know the sunshine coast is not a cheap area to buy into it is expensive 
as a starting point. But if you find the right type of property too, so for us, you know, in around that Marishidor CBD development, uh, the Sun City, Sun Central, you know, you know, we're seeing opportunities there for townhouses. You know, we're looking at a townhouse project uh, one street back from uh, the Marichi River, uh, which which ticks a box for us, and that's uh, you know. It hasn't been released to market yet. We're just talking to the developer and the builder is just going through a DA at the moment. And, uh, you know, we'll tick the box for some of our clients uh, with affordability and being in a place where we see continued growth for the next two to three years. As as um, uh, Paul alluded to too, Brisbane, I think, is a fantastic area. There's some great opportunities and pockets in Brisbane where around, uh, even around the new university, Launton, there's a couple of projects there that we're looking at. Uh, we love Morton Bay, uh, particularly around Redcliffe and uh, that Newport area. Uh, into Bracken Ridge, there's some great opportunities out at Redlands. There's some opportunity we've done at Big Point. We've got a client that we're, yeah. we're building for and getting a great result for her there. Um, you know, again, a couple of points. We're really, again, down in Victoria. Uh, there's Ballarat, Bendigo. We're kind of like this. There's, there's, uh, you know, I'm interested in Geelong, again, just because of the high-speed rail proposal that they're proposing there, although the yields down in Victoria are nowhere near what they are up here in Queensland. Uh, so, And that's why for us, Geelong, uh, sorry, Ballarat and Bendigo tick a box for us because we're still able to get those 5% plus. Adelaide, an old Adelaide boy from growing up, and, mm. you know, I, I like Adelaide. I think Adelaide has a lot going for it. But, again, you've got to... Get the right property in the right area. There's some great stuff in Grange and Henley, uh, Henley Beach and stuff like that. What well, the, the port in 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 uh, Elizabeth? Uh, no offence, when lives in Elizabeth, I don't want to live in Elizabeth. I live on the beach in, in Queensland. But um, there's great opportunity for uplift to growth with with some of the infrastructure projects that are going on there as well. Yeah, it's, it's timely that you, you mentioned some of those locations that you have, Ballarat and Bendigo, Regional Victoria generally, Launceston, I think you referred to Regional Tasmania, Adelaide, other locations. It's important for people to understand that there are actually growth markets in Australia right now because we've got a media that's telling us that um, prices are falling everywhere. But in actual fact, the locations you referred to are actually very, very strong growing market where prices are rising and that's... I guess one of the reasons why you're targeting those areas because they do have uh, growth drivers which are pushing up prices right now. Yeah. Well, interesting enough, is a lot of our clients are getting their uh, their um, uh, letters from the state government with their updated uh, unimproved land values, and all of them are seeing a lot of our clients uh, come back saying, "Hey, just seen a 10 percent, 15 percent increase in value." On my, unfortunately, it means potentially more rates, <laughs> higher rates. But uh, that's the negative. But the positive is, is we're seeing that continued growth on growth, which is what we're chasing. And ideally, for us, a client building a small portfolio, it's not about buying ten houses in ten years and you live forever. That doesn't happen. <laughs> um, it's about getting what's right for you today, allowing you to create some wealth through property, and then potentially using that to then go duplicate. Uh, within your comfort level and within your strategy, working with your accountant, with your planner, and with your team, to to give you options that we need. If we sit in there, we sit still, we don't do anything. We go backwards. And the reason why we're all here, we're all doing this, is because we we're wanting to be proactive in in what we do with with the equity that we have in our properties. Or if we're first starting out, even a first home buyer, we'll sit down and look at why, what, design, what's the purpose, what's the intent, what's your strategy, is it a long-term, short-term? So a lot of first-time buyers go in, it's just initially just to get them into the market, then they're going to use that property to then as a stepping stone for the next property. So getting those things right at the beginning is very important. Okay. So um, we're almost coming up um, almost perfectly to the hour since we, we launched the, the webinar, so we're, we're coming to the point where we should probably wrap it up. But... Um, Probably a good point to finish with is perhaps you could uh, tell us uh, if anybody's interested in what you've had to say today and they'd like to follow up and have a further discussion, perhaps um, talk about um, take advantage of the services you offer to property investors. How, what should they do? How do they follow up? How do they get in touch? Well, there's a number of different ways. Obviously, they can email us through invest at triple zero property.com.au, which is up there on the screen, or they can ring our one three hundred eight nine seven triple zero. 
Uh, anyone who does contact us and, and mention, uh, obviously, uh, our hospital webinar, uh, we're able to send them access to our conversations with uh, Terry, uh, our conversations with you, Terry, we did uh, late last year. Uh, video series, so a series of seven, seven nine videos. videos. Nine videos. Um, so just five minute videos, three, five, three to five minute videos just on different topics. Um, and just an opportunity for you to, so we'll just send you a link for those. Look, we, we're happy to sit down. There's no charge for our, our initial consultation and what we do. Uh, if obviously we're going down more the aggressive development process, we do charge a small fee. Uh, as there's a lot of work involved with us in trying to source, negotiate and find. But everything else uh, we do, um, we, we're paid by the builder uh, through a, a, like a, like a broker, it's paid by the bank. Um, because we're able to negotiate, we're doing that wholesale side of things, we're able to maximise uh, the return for our clients, we're able to guarantee fixed pricing throughout the process, uh, which is really important because I just, again, this morning having a meeting with a, someone from the bank, and they're talking to us about some of their clients, invariably getting variations upon variations where they're seeing cost blowouts. And we're able to mitigate against that through our process and through our relationship that we have with our panel builders. Yeah. But yeah, jump on our website, give us a call, shoot us an email. Um, uh, either way, just love to hear from you and then happy to have a conversation and whether we hook up on onto a uh, a Zoom or a Skype meeting or, or meet face to face, yeah, or on a phone, either yeah. way. We're based on the Sunshine Coast, but we service all over Australia. Yep, we have clients everywhere. We have clients mm -hmm. overseas as well, so yeah. all good. Okay, all right, well, that's a, a great point um, to wrap it up. Um, thanks, guys, for a great presentation. I found it informative and educational. Uh, great case studies. I think they graphically illustrated for people the the potentials and possibilities if you want to go a step further uh, beyond the the normal passive investment and be a bit more proactive or aggressive and um, manufacture some equity by doing small developments of certain types and uh, the various pros and cons, mostly pros, of uh, investing in new rather than secondhand property. So thank you to Danny and Paul and Stephen from Triple Zero Property. Um, this is uh, Terry Ryder from hotspotting.com.au signing off. Let's do it again soon. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, Terry.